This is a lecture on the Timbuktu narrative. And uh, what I mean by Timbuktu narrative is not the, the manuscripts written at Timbuktu, not in this case, but rather narratives written by uh, colonialist and imperialist travelers from places like England, France, Germany, and then later the United States who have traveled to Timbuktu and uh, traveled to Africa and have traditionally viewed Timbuktu as the, a, a place that is mysterious, wondrous, even a kind of an El Dorado, a city that is imagined to harbor unimaginable wealth, wealth and riches, and that is conceptualized as being effectively at, at the ends of the earth. Now, none of these descriptions of Timbuktu have much to do with the actual people who live in Timbuktu and have lived there for hundreds of years and have produced an amazing amount of literature, making Timbuktu one of the most important uh, intellectual centers of learning and most important center, library centers in the entire world for uh, hundreds of years. But, but the travelers who came to Timbuktu from France, Germany, uh, England, the United States often were totally oblivious to this dimension of its historical importance, as well as the importance of Timbuktu as a, a major city uh, for the uh, Songhe dynasty of the Askias, as well as for the Tureg people. So we're talking about a European genre, we're talking about travel writing, and we're talking about colonialist imperialist literature. And so uh, just a few caveats as we begin to look at some of these texts. And I'm, by the way, I'm dividing this uh, lecture into two parts, part one and part two. Uh, but just a few caveats, and that is this, this is a literature that is very problematic in many respects, very racist, and was deliberately intended to facilitate imperialism. And so um, it, it's not uh, to celebrate this literature that we're looking at it, but to understand more about what happened in that uh, air in, in the in the contact zone, as Mary Louise Pratt calls it, when European and American travelers first came to Africa and encountered the peoples of uh, Timbuktu and of what is today Mali and the Sahel zone in West Africa, which was one of the last places that European travelers were. Uh, you know, came to much of the previous interaction with African peoples in Africa, West Africa, especially had been along the coastal regions, not so much in these deep and this more deeper interior region. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's a problematic literature. It's a very problematic literature in many respects. And yet it's worthy of studying not only to understand the history of imperialism, uh, but to catch glimpses of life in West Africa, the culture of West Africa in the night, early, uh, well, say the early uh, uh, 19th century, late 18th century, and then throughout the 19th century. Um, but we have to read it uh, very critically, obviously, because it is so problematic. Now, I'm going to, uh, before we get too far into this, I want to just briefly uh, lay out the way that Fanon, Franz Fanon and the Wretched of the Earth theorized this question. And Fanon would call the early literature written by African people uh, a kind of a, a response literature. He called it a negation of a negation with the idea being that in this imperialist col uh, colonizing literature, pe indigenous peoples in West Africa had been negated in the descriptions uh, that these traveler, these travelers, and these travel writers uh, wrote about them, uh, and yet the, uh, the, the there was no way of ignoring these descriptions. One had to encounter them, one had to address them, and as Fanon would say, one had to uh, uh, negate that previous negation, uh, particularly if you were what Fanon would also call a comprador intellectual or a one of these handpicked intellectuals who was sent to Europe to be educated. And then you would encounter this vast body of literature depicting you or maybe your, your people, your family, your city in, in very uh, hostile ways. It's, it's, it's now it's, this literature is also akin to what Edward Said would call 
uh, an Orientalist literature. But when Said wrote his famous book, Orientalism, he was addressing the question of European depictions of Arab Muslims in the Middle East. And in, the, in this case, we're talking about Muslim peoples, but these are predominantly uh, black Muslim peoples, also Berber Muslim peoples, but they were written about in, in many stereotypical ways, uh, much like the literature investigated by uh, Edward Said in his book, Orientalism. And so his many of his theses are certainly applicable in this context. But as, as Fanon notes, um, you know, when we, when we think about the rise of anti-colonialist literature, it is a response literature because it's responding to this imperialist literature that we're going to be examining. And Fanon uh, broke, now remember Fanon died uh, in, in the uh, early 60s, right before the decolonization movements took steam and decolonization happened you know, throughout the continent of Africa. It only, it only happened in very limited places at the time. And he was writing from the, uh, from the uh, uh, situation of uh, being a, a migrant to Algeria. He grew up in Martinique, was educated in Paris. Excuse me, not, uh, yeah, was, uh, in, uh, well, he was a student of uh, Aimé Césaire's. But um, then he was educated in, in Paris, where he experienced terrible racism. And then he became a citizen of, of Algeria and fought in the war for Algerian independence against France. Uh, but he divides this into these various stages. He calls it pre-independence literature. And he says here, this is where native intellectuals, native African intellectuals in this case, show that they have assimilated the culture of the occupying power. Now, now to do this means that one must read that literature, which is often very unpalatable. Um, and then he speaks of what he calls the just before the battle literature, in which he says, I'm quoting Fanon, the natives are restless. This literature, you know, right before uh, the decolonization movements are inaugurated is dominated by humor and allegory. It is often symptomatic of a period of distress and difficulty. As Fanon says, we spew ourselves up, but underneath laughter can be heard. And then he speaks of what he calls fighting or revolutionary literature. This is a praxis oriented literature in which he says the understanding of a poem, for instance, is not merely an intellectual advance, but a political advance, one that advances the objectives of decolonization. OK, now, George M. Googleberger, uh, he puts it and he divides it in this and in, in these uh, cat into these categories, this development of post-colonial literature, the differences between colonial and post-colonial uh, literature. And of course, but in the case of Gugelberg, he's able to write from the perspective of having seen what happens after decolonization. And so he divides it into these kinds of categories, which I think we can use as broad rubrics in order to think about this literature. He speaks of what he calls a response literature, which is a literature that is responding to colonialism inciting the fight against oppression while using the literary tools of the oppressor. Okay, now, so in this sense, those three categories that we just saw in Fanon could all be incorporated in what he's, into what he's calling response literature. And, what, and the literature that we're going to look at, what I'm calling here the Ten Buck Two narrative, um, this is precisely the literature that the writers, uh, that the writer, early post-colonial African writers are responding to, that they had been exposed to while being educated in places like Paris, Lisbon, uh, London, and so on. Um, and then Googleberger speaks of what he calls an encomiastic literature. He says, this is a short phase celebrating nationalism and independence. Encomiastic literature emphasizes autonomous cultural values that are in, those that are indigenous to native culture and often evokes a kind of a race consciousness. We can think here, for instance, of the pan-Arab movement, the pan-African movement. And, uh, and then finally, Googleberger speaks of what he calls a post-colonial literature, but he puts this term post-colonial in quotes uh, because some, like, for instance, uh, Nungugi Wathuango, the Kenyan writer, prefer the term neo-colonial literature because the literature of, of the, that comes after uh, the, the colonizers are expelled then often simply means a new form of colonization is introduced, which is often, uh, often economic. Googleberger puts it in these terms. He says it's a literature which sees independence for what it is, a kind of a flag independence or false independence. 
a literature that assesses the new development of neocolonialism, and it tends to emphasize class consciousness rather than race consciousness. Now, these, these are broad ways of thinking about uh, you know, the development of post-colonial literature in response to colonial literature. But I think that you're going to see, as we look carefully at the Timbuktu narrative, at samples of the Timbuktu narrative, you're going to see uh, uh, what, what we're talking about here and why. I mean, in many ways, this, this literature is very kind of poisonous and toxic. But at the same time, it's, it's a literature that we cannot uh, ignore. And certainly, the early post-colonial writers could not ignore it as they were being educated in the European context and had and found themselves in a situation where they had to respond to this literature that had been produced about them, about their people in Europe by European writers. Okay, now um, colonialism itself, I, I, I'm printing up this map here because you can see here, this is at the apex of the colonialist period in 1914. This is what Africa would have looked like. Now you see here the modern nation states are also included in this map and they would not have been the time of 1914. But if you look at the different colors here, you can see uh, what parts of Africa went to what various European powers. And in, in, in the era, let's say after the Berlin Conference of 1885, in which Africa was uh, you know, divided up or sort of cut up like a big pie and parceled out to the various European powers who continually found themselves bumping in to one another in their fights for the spoils. Um, Vladimir Lenin, in his book, Imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, observes that, you know, World War I, at least in his reading of it, was, was not really about, for instance, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, who was assassinated in Sarajevo, but it was rather about uh, you know, it was about Africa. It was one way of thinking about it. It was the way Lenin thought about it. And his view, uh, whatever, whatever the truth of his view, it certainly was convincing to the Russian uh, soldiers who found themselves fighting in the trenches and asked themselves what it was that they were actually fighting for. And they didn't know. And as Lenin uh, observed, Russia had no holdings in Africa. So he said, this is, this is a colonialist war. Let the great, you know, colonialist powers fight one another for the spoils of Africa. And, and we know that, uh, that, that after World War I ended, one of the consequences of it was that Germany, for instance, lost many of its holdings in Africa. Okay, so you can see here on the map, if you look at, you know, Togo or Togoland, Cameroon, Southwest Africa, what is today uh, Namibia, German East Africa. These are all places where, where the Germans were seeking to colonize, and yet the Germans after World War I lost those colonial holdings. But you'll still find, for instance, in, in some rare instances, small, very small communities of people who are still German speakers in these former German uh, colonies. Now, in the, for, for our purposes, in the case of the Timbuktu narrative, you can see here that that what in what is today modern day Mali, where Timbuktu is located, that much of this part of Africa was uh, colonized by the French. The French uh, took it over, and you can see here also what is today Nigeria and Ghana, or the Gold Coast, and Sierra Leone were British holdings. Now, um, same is true of say East Africa. We can think of uh, Kenya as being a British holding also, but uh, this is also one of the reasons why the legacy, the linguistic legacy is that, you know, if many, for instance, African Americans, when they when they want to go visit Africa, will go to Ghana. And that's because of Ghana people speak English. Uh, and but but the part of Africa that we're studying is was is, was colonized by the French. And today, this legacy of, of, of its Francophone heritage is still evident. So if you want, for instance, to have a deeper experience of the Sahel, for instance, it's good to have the French language because it's still spoken very widely in the areas that were colonized uh, by the French. Um, so uh, this, I hope, gives you a, a kind of a sense of, of what Africa, you know, looked like at, almost at, 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 at the point where colonization began to go into a decline. Now, the travelers that we're going to look at who were instrumental in inaugurating what I'm calling here the Timbuktu narrative, uh, some were uh, English, some were, like in the case of Mungo Park, he was, he was a Scotsman, uh, 
Uh, some were German, like Heinrich Barth. Some were French, like René Caillé. Um, they, they were from all different, you know, uh, parts of Europe because at this time they were all jockeying to get possession of this part of Africa, which, as I said previously, had uh, not been, was, was, was simply unknown uh, to many what was going on in this part of Africa because the European encounter in West Africa was largely limited to the more coastal regions. Now, Timbuktu is one traveler called it came to be thought of as the bullseye of Africa with the th with the thinking being that if you if you could control this part if you if you could get to Timbuktu and take possession of it then then it was it became a kind of a, a symbol or a metonymy of what of taking possession of all of Africa so it became a very coveted spot and some of the first travelers were English but it, but the area uh, finally went to uh, the the French Okay, um, let's continue. Now, I, I show you, here, here's a map here uh, of, of modern day, this part of West Africa today. You can see Timbuktu there and Gao on the map. And if you go north of Timbuktu, north of Gao, there's the Sahara Desert. This is a very forbidding land, very difficult to, uh, to travel even today. And uh, it's always been a, a great obstacle uh, for those coming from the north to get to the south is how do you, how do you do this? How, what, what do you do about the Sahara? Now, so, some of the travelers, like in the case of Alexander Gordon Lang, who came to Timbuktu from Tripoli, will come from the north. Rene Caillé, Mungo Park, came from the more Senegambia region uh, to avoid having to go through the, uh, the, the Sahara Desert. Franz Fanon, would dream of creating a kind of a super highway linking north to south, but this remains uh, a mere dream, and the Sahara remains a, a very prominent obstacle uh, to uh, those who want to get from north to south. But but Timbuktu was important also because it it was the, it was the cultural hub. Now now the Touareg people would often bring goods to the north. They were the, they were the people who roamed. The uh, the Sahara Desert, and they could they could on their camels they would bring goods from Timbuktu to the north. In some cases, even gold, and so this is also how the legend of Timbuktu began to circulate in uh, in Europe. Okay, now let's put this in a broader historical context, and I'm assuming that those who are coming to this lecture are coming uh, to this material for the first time. But you've probably heard the name, even so. Of Vasco da Gama. Now, in the case of da Gama, uh, he uh, was he left for about the same time on his uh, journeys, on his travels by boat, about the same time that Christopher Columbus traveled to the Americas. In both cases, they were seeking to arrive at the same place, which is to say, India, because the belief was was that if you could if you could establish a trade route to India your fortune would be made. And, and part of the problem was that many of the spices and goods that came from India had to pass through uh, Muslim lands to arrive in Europe. And they often had, that included great taxes uh, as, as well. And so uh, if you could find a way to get to India and obviate having to go through these lands, um, these Islamic lands, then, uh, you know, your fortune would be made. And so what, what da Gama did was he came around the uh, Horn of Africa in what is today uh, South Africa, and he got into uh, you know uh, the Zanzibar area in East Africa, what's today Kenya, and he found there that there were Arab trading posts already established. That Arab traders had been there, in fact, a long time, but the Portuguese began to establish themselves in this part of Africa as well. Because another thing that Da Gama discovered was that there was a very favorable trade wind from the east coast of Africa to India, that if you caught the monsoon at the right time of year, it would blow you to one part. It would simply blow you all the way to India and it would blow you back in the counter monsoon. And so this, this was the golden uh, pass that everyone was looking for. Now, uh, the Portuguese, however, later would establish a colony in the Americas, particularly in Brazil, where Portuguese obviously is still spoken today. Uh, and they they uh, were not able to contain to to keep both holdings 
And eventually the British uh, attacked the Portuguese and established their own forts and the Portuguese abandoned their, uh, their forts in East Africa and the British came in and this was the beginning of the British being able to establish uh, their uh, uh, imperial uh, holdings in India and to colonize India. But also, I mean, at first they just, they on, in East African places like Kenya, they really had uh, only an interest in establishing forts to get them to India. But later they began to colonize this part of Africa as well. Uh, but in the part, again, in the part of Africa that we're exploring, it was mostly uh, colonized by the French. Uh, now here you can see uh, a map of the different you know routes that the travelers took. Columbus going to the West Indies, uh, Da Gama going to the East Indies, as you can see here. Now uh, Leo Africanus was a very interesting traveler who was a Moroccan traveler who, from Fez who lived from 1494 to 1554. His uh, birth, his name at birth was Al Hassan Ibn Muhammad Al Wazan Al Fasi, and he was a, a Muslim from Morocco, a Berber, and uh, you know he uh, you know was was a, a traveler to Timbuktu. So he went on a, on a trip to Timbuktu, and he saw it, and he had an experience of it at a time that very few people had seen Timbuktu, and in fact he went to Timbuktu precisely at the time that the Askiya Muhammad had risen to power and the Songhe dynasty had first uh, established itself. And so he got, a, he got an early rare glimpse of Timbuktu. And later he was uh, captured and imprisoned uh, by Europeans and, and enslaved and taken to Rome where he converted to Christianity. This was most likely a conversion of um, convenience. In fact, I think later he, he reverted to his original religion, but it was, he didn't have a whole lot of choice at the time. Um, and, but he, uh, while living in Rome and working in the service of the Pope, he produced in both Arabic and later Italian a, uh, a, 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 an account of his travels to West Africa and to Timbuktu. And this account that he wrote was translated into many European languages. And so it's largely Leo Africanus who established an image of Timbuktu in the European imagination as a place of tremendous wealth. And, uh, and, and, and this is really where the legend of Timbuktu was, was born for Europeans as, as, this, as the rumor of its great wealth and gold began to circulate as a result of the descriptions of Leo Africanus. Um, here's a, a quote from his account. He says, The rich king of Tumbuktu hath many plates and scepters of gold, some wherewith weight 1,300 pounds, and he keeps a magnificent and well-furnished court. Okay. Then also, uh, as Bovel comments, uh, in August uh, 1594, a man named Lawrence Maddock reported to his principal in London, uh, uh, in from Morocco, the arrival from the Sudan of 30 mules laden with gold. Uh, but this was only the beginning of a flow which was to amaze the world. And Maddox said, for instance, it doth appear that they from Timbuktu have more gold than any part of the world. And so this, this image of Timbuktu as a place of gold uh, inflamed the European imagination. Now we know in, in truth that Timbuktu was a place of great learning. It was effectively a, uni a university town with vast libraries of manuscripts. But for the for Europeans, it was a place, it was, it was thought of as a kind of an El Dorado or a city of, of, of gold where, where gold was, was everywhere. Um, now here you can see this is where the Songhe Empire uh, was, was located in the 15th and 16th century. You can see Timbuktu there on the Joliba, the Niger River, Gao, which was the, the administrative capital of the empire. On the left, you see the, uh, the tomb of the Askiya Muhammad where he's buried. This you can find this in, in Gao today. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is what he visited. And this was, uh, he came, uh, Leo Africanus came to Timbuktu at a time when it was enjoying particularly particular prosperity under the reign of the Askiya Muhammad, who was the greatest uh, 
of the Ischias who founded the dynasty. Okay, now let's also note in the backdrop of this, we have the question of the transatlantic triangle that then develops or the, 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 the slave trade. And as you can see here on the coast of West Africa, you can see this is a coast which shows you slave centers uh, and they're all along the coast that the, the interior was essentially unknown. Now, remember when Timbuktu was finally taken by the French, the general that took it, uh, General Jacques, uh, General uh, Joffrey, um, was a, uh, was in effect a, a general who also served in World War I. And so that should give you a sense of how late it was that Europeans were finally successful in colonizing this part of Africa. So when we think of the slave trade, you know, many of those who were, were placed on these terrible uh, slave ships were those who were taken in intertribal conflicts from the interior. And this is a very complex question that we're not going to get into too far in this, uh, in this lecture today because it falls outside of the parameters of our concerns for this particular study. Uh, but but I want to get I just want you to keep this in the background because some some of the travelers also were um, you know were motivated by abolitionist uh, concerns they were anti-slavery particularly the British the British uh, um, they banned slavery in around you know eighteen twenty or so they 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 or well, it was a little earlier than that but they but the abolitionist movement didn't really take off until about eighteen twenty in England but. Um, the and the Americas abolition was or, or the slave trade, I should say, was you know continued much, much longer. And so the British abolished slavery before it was abolished in the Americas. And many of the British travelers were motivated to you know to help bring it into the slave trade. And so that's part of what we'll see uh, in, in the backdrop of some of these uh, slave, uh, some of these narratives, this question of the abolition of slavery, some from figures like Richards, James Richardson, for instance. Um, but I, but you can see here uh, that what had developed, what what facilitated this uh, the, the slave trade was that England was uh, had, was at this time the most advanced industrial ca uh, pre-capitalist, early capitalist society. And it had, you know, developed the ability to produce goods like textiles and guns, but it essentially saturated the European market. And so part of the motive of the Europeans was to find a place to dump its cheap goods in Africa, to find a new market of buyers for its product. And, and the Niger River was a particularly important place uh, that that was that one that one wanted to find because one felt that if you could get onto the Niger, you would have a kind of a super highway to drop these these cheap goods produced in England's factories, and so ships would come from England filled with goods. They'd arrive on the coast, trade the goods for slaves who were often non-Muslims uh, who were taken in battle. In some cases, Muslims uh, did get caught in the in the slave trade. But often they were uh, those who were captured in any case in uh, intertribal conflicts and then were placed on the ships in exchange for the goods brought from England, brought to the Americas, and then there uh, dropped off and enslaved and held in slavery. Uh, and, but then the slave ships would be loaded with sugar, tobacco, rum, and so on, and then brought back to England. And then the, and then the, uh, it would begin all over again. And many of these uh, barbaric figures who, who uh, participated in the slave trade uh, would, could make their fortunes by simply one run. Sometimes they did two or three or four runs. Uh, but this, this is essentially how it functioned. This is in the backdrop of our uh, discussion. I just want you to bear that in mind. Okay, now in 1788 to 1805, the African Association formed in England and I, I would note here that uh, that England itself did not get serious about the exploration of the West African interior until about 1805. And so this association was not an official governmental association. It was made up of, uh, of, of, of different you know, entrepreneurs and explorers and scientists and so on who would gather together and they pooled their resources to fund the travels of those uh, hardy uh, 
young men who were willing to make these these trips, uh, you know, usually at the risk of their lives. And, and a lot of times those who did travel uh, died. Many, many there there were others that I uh, that I'm, I won't be mentioning who, who left but never uh, made it back. And in fact, you know, we can't I'm, I'm only going to be picking out a few of the emblematic instances that established this literary genre. There were many, many others uh, uh, that I could have selected. It's, 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 there's a vast uh, literature, uh, colonialist, imperialist literature centered around the quest to arrive at Timbuktu. And I would just note in passing, it's by no means a thing of the past. Uh, there, there, are, uh, there are many accounts, even very recent accounts of, of those travelers who get misty eyed and dream about coming to this place, which is a kind of a fabrication of their own uh, imagination, which has little to do with the historical, actual Timbuktu. But as a Bohan notes in this uh, quote, one striking feature of European activities in Western Africa from the late 15th to the late 18th centuries was their obvious limitation in scope and objective. Uh, these uh, activities were confined entirely to the coastal periphery and their purpose was economic, the tapping of the human and mineral resources of the country. But, but the interior um, where these dynasties, for instance, flourished was simply, it was just unknown. Europe did not know what was going on there and they were very curious and they were particularly curious about Timbuktu. So here were some motives for exploration, you know, beyond the obvious uh, crassly uh, imperialist ones uh, for the English and their coming to West Africa. One was abolitionists, many of the travelers were abolitionists. Uh, there was also the problem of the loss of North American uh, export outlets after the uh, War of Independence in the United States. There was the um, exploration of so the, the question of the exploration of the source and termination of the Niger River, or the Joliba, uh, which many uh, did feel uh, that, that the feeling at the time was that there might be that maybe the Niger was connected to the Nile or might even have been the same river as the Nile. And so there was a great deal of interest in finding out the secrets of, of the Niger River. And then there were the scientific uh, endeavor to explore botany and natural history. A lot of passionate botanists at this time. Mungo Park, one of the first travelers from England to West Africa, was in fact a, a botanist. Uh, and again, I note here in passing that the abolitionist movement in England didn't really gain traction until the mid uh, 1820s. Okay, so now here's an image of Mungo Park. He lived from 1771 to 1806. He was referred to in his time as England's Ulysses, and he was a he was kind of a a figure, kind of like a Neil Armstrong figure in the public imagination. People thought he was this such an amazing person because he was the first person who went and caught a glimpse of the Niger. River. He drank from the Joliba, the Niger. He did not, however, his goal was to make it to Timbuktu. He did not, in fact, make it to Timbuktu. He took two different trips. Uh, the first trip that he took, he wrote about, and it was published in a book called Travels in the Interior of Africa, published in 1799. Now, this was a major uh, bestseller of his time. He was, he was celebrated everywhere as this very successful traveler who had endured a great deal of suffering uh, and had seen uh, this finally had gotten to see a part of the world that no uh, European hitherto at that point had seen. And, um, and he wrote about it in his travels. It remains one of the more readable of uh, contributions to this genre. It's, it's an inaugural contribution as well. Uh, now he, he went back to Africa a second time. And the second time that he went back, he lost his life. He, and again, he, he went back because he did not, he had not made it to Timbuktu. He wanted to make it to Timbuktu. And, um, he, but the second time he went back, he, he was killed and, um, he was killed on the Niger river, but his note, some of his notes came back and this, the journal of his second trip was published in 1815. Now here you can see his, his mission was fourfold. First, he was there to discover the course of the Niger River, largely for reasons of commerce. He was there to get to the fabled city of Timbuktu, but also to find Hausa land as well, um, where Muhammad Bello was, had established his, the, the Sokoto Empire. 
He was uh, there to explore the animals, vegetables, minerals. Again, he was, a, he was a passionate botanist, as were many of the travelers. And fourthly, uh, he was there to document, like in an ethnological sense, ethnographic, the religion, language, and cultures of those peoples that he encountered. Um, here is a map that shows you his two journeys. As you can see, he started from the Senegambia area and came into the uh, interior through Bamako up to Segu area. And then he, uh, well, he had to turn around. He didn't, he didn't make it. His second trip, he, uh, he, he got as far as, uh, you can see Lake Dubo there at the end, but he, he uh, crashed on the uh, shoals of, of the Joliba and he was, while, while he was being attacked from the shore. Uh, but his legend lived on long after his death, not just in England, but in, in, uh, in West Africa itself, where, for instance, there are you know, generations of Africans who named their children Mungo Park after him. He became this kind of legendary figure that, that in, in the memory of those uh, who saw him in his journeys. Um, now here you can see there is a, a picture of Mungo Park at the Joliba where he you know, famously drank from. There's the Niger River, which he was searching for. Uh, and, uh, but he didn't, again, he didn't make it back the second time. Now, many of the lands that, that Park traveled through were Mande lands. Uh, and so he, the descriptions that he brought back were of descriptions of the Mande uh, peoples and uh, but he also because this was you know where the uh, Mande Empire of Sunjiata Keita was had been established uh, and and there were there still this is still very predominantly Mande part of, of West Africa today but he also encountered the Fulani uh, the Pular or the Pulars are sometimes called the Pul he encountered the the Tuareg. Uh, he encountered others on his travels, but but pr but primarily he traveled through Mande lands. And here again, uh, you can see this is an image from his book there on the far right of a griot, we call, what he part called the singing man, the singing men of the Sahel, who were Mande griots who sang the praises of Sunjiata Keita, the founder of the Mande uh, dynasty, the very famous founder also of, of, of the uh, famous because of the Mande Charter, which is one of the first documents of uh, of human rights uh, produced in the uh, early part of the 13th century. Um, he also recorded a famous incident that became very popular in England. And, and then this word mumbo jumbo, this incident that he recorded passed into the English language. Mumbo jumbo was a kind of a figure that would, a masked figure that would appear. And uh, and, and this, this figure was, uh, it proved to be, an enticing figure for his English readers. And today we get this word mumbo jumbo enters into the English you know, language. We, uh, etymologically speaking, one often forgets where it comes from today. Some of you say, well, somebody speaks mumbo jumbo. It's like they're speaking nonsense, but this was not uh, what Park had seen. Let me show, let, let's read Park's description of mumbo jumbo. It's one of the more famous incidents from the narrative. I just, pick, I just picked out a few of the, of the more emblematic uh, moments in the text. This is one of the more famous ones. He said, Mumbo Jumbo is a strange bugbear employed by the pagan Mandingos for the purpose of keeping their women in subjugation. Polygamy being allowed among these people, every man marries as many wives as he can conveniently maintain. And the consequence is that family quarrels sometimes rise to such a height that the husband's authority is not sufficient to restore peace among the ladies. On these occasions, the interposition of mumbo jumbo is called in, and it is always decisive. This strange minister of justice, who is either the husband himself or some person instructed by him, disguised in a sort of masquerade habit made of the bark of trees and armed with the rod of public authority, announces his coming by loud and dismal screams in the woods near the town. He begins his pantomime at the approach of night, and as soon as it is dark, he enters the town and proceeds to the bentong or marketplace at which all the inhabitants immediately assemble. The ceremony commences with songs and dances which continue till midnight, about which time Mumbo fixes on the offender. <clears throat> 
This unfortunate victim, being thereupon immediately seized, is stripped naked, tied to a post, and severely scourged with Mumbo's rod amidst the shouts and derision of the whole assembly. And it is remarkable that the rest of the women are the loudest in their exclamations on the occasion, on this occasion against their unhappy sister. So this, this image of mumbo jumbo and the, and the sound, I think, of the words themselves, like the sound of the words Timbuktu, uh, en enchanted his, his readers. And so it became one of the more famous moments of this text. Uh, daylight puts to an end this un indecent and unmanly revel. That the women are deluded seems evident, for Park assures us that the dress of Mumbo is suffered to hang from a tree at the entrance of each town, which would hardly be the case if the women were not persuaded that it is the dress of some supernatural being. Okay, now another uh, another key instance that became kind of famous in this text was there was there was a time when 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 you know Park went through many trials and sufferings and they were they were celebrated as his as instances of his perseverance again he was seen as a kind of an odysseus figure or ulysses figure and in one case he was really uh really in in a lot of trouble and was but see these these four women took care of him and they sang a song for him and the song was even sort of was set was was set to uh, music or was was written when he returned the words and the music were written down it became a kind of a a popular hit that people would sing and this this is the the, the lyrics of the song that were tra that we would tra if you translate them from the mandate is that the winds roared and rains fell the poor white man which would be part faint and weary came and sat under our tree he has no mother to bring him milk no wife to grind his corn and then the chorus, let us pity the white man. No mother has he. And Park states, trifling as this recital may appear to the reader, to a person in my who's a difficult situation, the circumstance was affecting in, affecting in the highest degree in which he was emotionally moved or touched by their care for him. I was oppressed by such unexpected kindness and sleep fled from my eyes. Now, when he says he's oppressed, or he doesn't mean that he was literally oppressed. He means that he was overwhelmed by the by the kindness that they showed him in his difficulties but this became a kind of a popular hit song in uh, in europe or in england i should say now he did not receive such welcoming treatment at the hands of the Tuareg or who he calls the, the moor now uh you can see here in the middle on this map an image of uh, the uh, of the place, the traditional ancestral place where the Tuareg have lived. The Tuareg are nomadic people. Sometimes they're referred to as the blue men of the desert. They uh, are they care for the camel. They're closely associated and linked with the camel. They often carried salt caravans, bringing salt, and they would cross the Sahara Desert and bring the goods from uh, south to north. They were the, they were the masters of the camel, but also the masters of the desert. Park did not like them at all, and indeed, many of the European travelers really did not like uh, the Touareg, and, and, and the British and French alike saw the Touareg as proposing the most significant obstacle to the colonization of this region. And indeed, today, uh, Mali, Niger, and the southern uh, southern Algeria, and Libya as well, these remain troubled parts of, um, of uh, West Africa where they're still are, uh, are difficulties because the Touareg never really accepted the way in which the French partitioned their ancestral uh, lands deliberately following a policy of divide and conquer as, as the French did and the Touareg you know, lost their um, ancestral homelands and they're still to this day fighting for uh, independence. But, but Park really didn't like them and you can see his descriptions are particularly racist when it comes to the Touareg. Uh, here, let's, let's read his description. He says, I fancied that I discovered in the features of most of them, these Tuareg, a disposition toward cruelty and low cunning. I could never contemplate their physiognomy without feeling sensible uneasiness. From the staring wildness of their eyes, a stranger would immediately set them down as a nation of lunatics, he says, boasting an advantage over the Negroes by possessing, though in a very limited degree, the knowledge of letters, they are at once the vainest and proudest and perhaps most bigoted 
ferocious and intolerant of all the nations on earth. Well, that's a pretty strong denunciation there. Combining in their character the blind superstition of the Negroes with the savage cruelty and treachery of the era. All right, so you, you can get a sense there of how, um, how strongly he disliked the, the Tuareg. And, and indeed, when you read this colonialist literature, this imperialist literature of the Timbuktu narrative, you'll often find very hostile descriptions of, of the Tuareg. Now, remember, this is also an or like in the Said sense, this is an Orientalist literature. And so some of these cliches, these racial stereotypes will, will come to be repeated over and over and over again. I just want to emphasize this because when you think about how uh, other travelers who would come after Park would have read his uh, descriptions, it would, in, in a way, it fixed their understanding of the Tuareg even before they had encountered the Tuareg. And so it became a kind of a, what, what uh, you know, Edward Said uh, would call an ide resu, or quoting, you know, Flaubert, or received idea. And so these received ideas would become, would, would circulate in this uh, racist and imperialist discourse. Now, he also encountered the, the Pul or the Fulani people. Now, the word, uh, in a lot of English scholarship, the word Fulani is used uh, in, in, the, in the French scholarship, it's Poul, sometimes Poulard. You can see here in the green the, the main sites of where the, the Fulani have historically resided. You can see their Futa Torah, which is today in northern uh, Senegal, the Futa Jalan, Messina area, Sokoto. Um, so these are where, now the Fulani are, uh, are also part Arab. So they're, they're part black, part Arab. They are part Somatic. They, so they, they're, they're a mixed uh, people. And in the legends of the Fulani, it's the uncles of the prophet Muhammad in some cases who are said to have married with local women, uh, Arabs who brought Islam to the region. And so they're, they're a mixed ethnic group. And so he encountered in addition to Mande, and Tureg, or, or what he was calling them more, he also encountered the Fulani people as well. And in one case, he was robbed by a, a group of Fulani bandits. And this became yet another of the more famous instances in his narrative. Uh, and uh, uh, it involved what uh, Mary Louise Pratt will call the Parks of Botanist Epiphany, where he was you can see there in the image on the right, he was robbed and left on the floor of the forest. You can see the, the bandits are leaving. They left him there. And he was really at the very, he was at his lowest point at this moment in the narrative, just about ready to give it all up when his eyes fell upon a, a plant that he hadn't seen before. And he said, asked himself, well, if, if uh, you know, if God can create this plant with such concern, he must care about me as well. And it's, and, and it gives him the resolve and strength to get up and continue his journey. Um, Mary Louise Pratt will call this the anti-conquest or an instance of how what is in fact an imperialist venture becomes depicted in, in non-imperialist terms. Um, it's, it's, and so here, here's how she describes it. Let me read her language. She says, the epiphany brought on by the fructifying moss is a transcendent moment, not because Park has survived, but because he has lost everything. He is no longer defined by European commodities. Park has become the creature in whose viability and authenticity his readers may have longed to believe. The naked, essential, inherently powerful white man. Well, that's the way that uh, Pratt puts it. Um, it's interesting. I think it's a compelling reading. Uh, her book is certainly worth the read if you're interested in the history of uh, imperialist literature. Um, but here's, here's Park's own description of this moment. He says, some of the bandits went away with my horse and the remainder stood considering whether they should leave me quite naked or allow me something to shelter me from the sun. Humanity at last prevailed. They returned to me the worst of my two shirts and a pair of trousers. And as they went away, one of them threw back my hat in the crown of which I kept my memorandums. And this was probably the reason they did not wish to keep it. And so Park picks himself up off the ground and he continues on his journey. Um, now, again, when he returned the second time, this image will show you an illustration of the death of Park on the Niger River. He got as far as Busa, Nigeria. This is the part. Today, the dam has been built there, but this was the part where, where there were like a waterfalls and shoals. And 
he was attacked from the shore and he didn't did not uh, survive. It remains to be seen why or remains to be asked why he felt it necessary to return. It is said that when he went back, he was very bored and he he was itching. To, I mean, as much as he suffered, he was itching to get back from the minute that he uh, returned to England. All right. Now, the first uh, traveler, European traveler, English traveler, who uh, was successful in visiting Timbuktu was Alexander Gordon Lang, although he was not the first to visit it and come back alive. He died on his return trip, but some of his notes came back. Now, he lived in 1794 through 18. 26 and he arrived in Timbuktu in August in 1826. Now Lang was something of a pompous figure and many of his descriptions of what he saw that, that did get back were uh, probably uh, inflated. He, you know, he, he, he had a very high sense of himself and he, uh, he, he, he uh, described Timbuktu in somewhat grandiose terms. Lang also is notable because he was, you know, he was very adamant about wearing his uniform. He did not go in any disguise. He came very specifically as a uniformed British officer, and he made no bones about that. Uh, but at the end, he did not come back with, even though he got to Timbuktu, he did not come back uh, alive. He was beheaded by a Tureg in, in the Sahara Desert. Um, around the same time that Lang traveled to Timbuktu, he went on the Timbuktu mission, there was another uh, two travelers, Hugh Clapperton and Dixon Denham, who uh, went on the famous Borno mission. Now, Richard Lander, who you see there in the middle, was the assistant of Clapperton on a later mission. But this mission, the Borno mission, which uh, was launched about the same time that Lang went to Timbuktu, was undertaken by Clapperton and Denham. And, and, and really, uh, Denham wanted to get the Timbuktu mission. He didn't get it. It went to Lang. But he went on this mission with Clapperton. And uh, their part of the, the goal there was to that they had was to meet with uh, Muhammad Bello and to negotiate an end with him to the end of, of the slave trade. Lander is kind of an interesting figure as well. Uh, Clapperton died uh, in his travels like Lang, like Park. Uh, he didn't make it back alive on his second trip when he went with Lander, but Lander completed his second mission, which was successful. Um, now, when uh, when Clapperton went to uh, Sokoto, you can see there on the modern map where Sokoto would have been at this time in relation to modern uh, maps or modern nations today. And the image that you see there is is it's not an actual photograph of Mohammed Bello, but it's it's taken from the description given by Clapperton of what he might have looked like. And Bellow, I mean, this is a really interesting moment in the history of the slave trade. You know, Bellow, as you can see, lived in 1781 to 1837. And now, of course, in Islam, Islam does allow for slavery, uh, and, 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 but it, it never allowed for the, the enslavement of Muslims. And so what was happening that concerned Bellow was that some Muslims were getting caught up in the slave trade. And so he, uh, the British were at a, you know, militating for abolition, and Bello was interested in also, you know, helping to bring it in to the the transatlantic slave trade anyway, uh, because he he was concerned about you know Muslims who are getting caught up in the slave trade, and so he and Clapperton negotiated uh, an agreement which then affected uh, British relations in the area and contributed towards the abolition movement. Uh, but here here you can see a. Uh, uh, a map of the travel routes of these various travelers. Now, if, if you can see Tripoli there on the map, which is in modern day Libya, uh, Alexander Gordon Lang traveled from Tripoli to Timbuktu across the Sahara Desert, very difficult path, didn't make it back from Timbuktu, uh, was beheaded in the desert. Um, the the Denim, Denim uh, Clapperton mission went from Tripoli, as you can see down there, to Borno, to Sokoto, and then back. Uh, whereas Rene Caillé, who was the first European to go to Timbuktu and to, and to live to tell the tale, who, who, who uh, survived, uh, came in from the more uh, Senegambia area and up through Jene and then Timbuktu. And then he traveled through the, uh, the Sahara Desert 
up to Fez in Morocco and Rabat, where he then returned uh, home. And he uh, he did uh, he was he became quite you know famous because he succeeded in doing what no one else hitherto at that point uh, had not succeeded in doing. Now we're going to see that one of the main differences which enabled him to succeed was that he disguised himself as an Egyptian uh, Muslim and went uh, you know went in uh, dressed in a particular way and adopted particular religious customs that Lang refused to do. Um, here's, here's some quotes from Lang, and you'll see kind of what a pompous figure he was. He says, I have not traveled to Timbuktu for the sake of any other reward than that which I shall derive from the consciousness of having achieved an enterprise which will rescue my name from oblivion. I am sanguine in my hopes of accomplishing a visit to the far-famed capital of Central Africa, or Timbuktu, the spot where the adventurous park lost his life. Actually, he didn't lose it in Timbuktu. But here's, here's another uh, quote. What a sad thing it is to be a lion. <laughs> He's talking about himself. Uh, I am not a little pleased when I look at the great improvement I am making already and contemplate those I shall make in the map of Africa. So he was a very guy, kind of a fool of himself type figure, very pompous. Uh, now he, when he, uh, you can look at the description below when he, before he got into Timbuktu, he was already attacked by Turek in the desert. He says they entered, this is a description of what happened from Bobo. They entered Lang's tent and before he could arm himself, he was cut down by a sword on the thigh. He jumped again, he again jumped up and received one cut on the cheek and ear and the other on the right arm above the wrist, which broke the arm. He then fell on the ground where he received seven cuts the last being on his neck, all right? And so very wounded, he limped into Timbuktu, and you can see there on the top, he says, I wrote with a thumb and finger having a very severe cut on my uh, forefinger. So he pulled himself together, wrote his notes, and, and people kind of just like, you know, looked, I mean, they, they remembered him very well. He's like, Who, what is he doing here? They didn't quite know what to make of him, uh, but he was, his execution on his return was ordered and he was he was indeed killed. Rene Caillé later uh, saw uh, or, or, or spoke with people. He went to the he saw the site where he was executed and heard the story of what happened and brought back the report from his travels. And here's what Caillé said. He said, "I learned that Lang was tormented to say there is but one God and that Muhammad is his prophet, but he had always but he always stopped at the words there is but one God. Then they called him a kafir and infidel." Lang continued firm, and he chose to die rather than to yield. Uh, this is not the option that, that Rene Caillé took, as we're going to see. Uh, Caillé, Caillé goes on, they put him to a cruel death. And after this shocking action, they searched his baggage. Everything of a useless nature, uh, papers, letters, and books, were torn and thrown to the winds for fear they should contain some magic, and the articles of value were retained. Okay, now here's here's Rene Caillé. You can see there on the far left. Uh, there he is in the middle, disguised as an Egyptian Muslim on his travels. Interesting figure. You know, he was born in 1799, the same year that Park's travel log was published. He died in 1838. He was a very poor. He was a peasant, and he was not as highly educated, say, as someone like Gordon Lang. He was a very humble figure. And uh, he was he wasn't going under anybody's uh, auspices he, or any government. He just you know he wanted to be the first one to go to Timbuktu, and he was he was obsessed with this goal. And so he went to West Africa. He learned uh, Arabic. He learned he disguised himself as a Muslim. It took him many years, but he uh, he finally succeeded in his goal. He he experienced many many deprivations and sufferings, and so his travel log is remarkable as a kind of a sadomasochistic account of just taking blow after blow, but finally, you know, making it to the fabled city. Now you can see there on the far right, a postage stamp from the Republic of Mali on the 180th anniversary of his uh, birth. So he, and there are statues of him, plaques and so on of the house on the house that he stayed in. So he became in his own way, a legendary figure. And at first nobody could even believe that he made it. Uh, uh, he, it just seemed uh, not believable. 
but finally he he people began to accept that he had made it and then he became a very celebrated figure as well admired for his perseverance uh in in, in his uh, in the face of adversary adversity and in, in his you know, many many sufferings he suffered a great deal uh, to reach this goal but he did make it back to tell the tale um, there you can see on on the right the 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 uh, again the path that he took when he made it to Timbuktu successfully uh, his volume of travels travels through Central Africa to Timbuktu 1824 through 1828 published in 1830 um, is a two volume uh, account he, you know his his language is very simple he's again not a very highly educated figure uh, but but it, it's it's interesting and he comes through as a kind of some people saw him in kind of almost saintly terms because he had such a humble uh, demeanor and it was partly this which enabled him to uh, to succeed. And there you can see on, on the left uh, an image of the of, of the city of Timbuktu itself, which was drawn upon his uh, description of it after his return. Um, here's in 1828, here's this very, this is perhaps the most famous passage in his text. Uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson, as a young man, wrote his, uh, one of his earliest poems based on this uh, description that, of Timbuktu that Kaye wrote. Now you can see here, what's interesting about this description is that it's, uh, it, on the one hand, you see his wonderment at, at what he finds, there, on the other hand, you see his disappointment because, after all, after all these legends about the gold of Timbuktu, he gets there and it's not quite what he thought it was. It's more of a, it's more humble than he thought. I mean, Timbuktu's real gold, of course, are in its libraries, but uh, you know, he had a different kind of idea. He thought he was going to find El Dorado. Uh, all right, let's read his description. At last, we happily arrived in Timbuktu. He says, just as the sun set along the horizon, I therefore beheld the Sudanese capital which for so long had been the object of my desires. Upon entering this marvelous city, the focus of so much inquiry among the civilized nations of Europe, I was seized by an inexpressible feeling of satisfaction. I had never before experienced a sensation like it, and my joy was extreme. When my enthusiasm abated, I found that the spectacle before my eyes was not at all what I had expected. I had formed a wholly different idea of the grandeur and wealth of this town. At first glance, it seemed little more than a mass of mud huts, poorly constructed. In every direction, an immense plain of shifting sands, white streaked with yellow, and the greatest aridity unfolded before me. The sky along the horizon was pale red. All of nature seemed sad, and the greatest silence reigned there. You could not hear the singing of a single bird, and yet, there was something inexpressibly imposing about this great town built in the midst of sand. You could not help but admire the efforts of those who had founded it. So, yeah, again, I, you, you might have a look at the little poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Uh, and it, it, it goes through this sort of like, you know, like expectations versus smashed expectations, you know, versus reality. Now, uh, he didn't find the goal that he was seeking. Uh, but he did, he did find it to be worth the uh, effort after all. Um, now, when he returned through the desert, now you remember he went back through the Sahara Desert to make his way back to Europe, uh, and he suffered terribly. Now, I, I, there are many, many descriptions of his sufferings. I'm just going to pull out one here so you can get a sense of what he went through uh, trying to get back. He says, here's his description of his traveling with the truck. He says, they gave me ridiculous nicknames, calling me a gagabuff from the name of the camel I rode on, and I was constantly exposed to their insult and raillery. They were, they were skeptical that he truly was who he said that he was, and of course he wasn't who he said that he was, and they were, they were suspicious of him, and they subjected him to great insults and uh, torture even. Uh, encouraged by my silence and patience, they set their slaves to follow their example, and the slaves were delighted to torment me. They were continually ridiculing the form of my face. He had a very large uh, nose. They compared his nose to the nose of a camel. And they carried their ill nature so far as to throw stones at me when I turned my back. All this persecution was at the instigation of their masters, who often supplied them with branches of thorns to thrust into my face. At other times, they took little pieces of wood and proposed that 
that their slaves should drive them through my nose as they do with their camels. These slaves, encouraged by the visible satisfaction of their masters, collected around me, laughing violently, capering, dancing, and showing me first the branch of thorns and then the piece of wood which they had been ordered to run through my nose. In this way, I was tormented all the way from Teleg to Tafalet. So you can see there the kind of suffering that he went through, but that, but that led also to the admiration of him from others. Now, some also, though, however, criticized him because, again, he pretended to be a Muslim and some people felt that, that Lang took a far more nobler path by refusing to pretend to be a Muslim and sticking firm to his Christian beliefs. Uh, but Kaye, you know, paid for it with his life. Uh, excuse me, uh, Lang paid for it with his life. Kaye got back. And so this is one of, this is one of the last uh, uh, paragraphs in his second volume of his travelogue. You can see how bitter he felt about these criticisms of his pretending to be a Muslim. He says, I have been accused of changing my religion at every station. To this malevolent imputation, I answer that I externally adopted the forms of the Mahometan worship as the only means of penetrating into the countries through which I traveled, an achievement which without this acquiescence would have been impractical, except by encountering at every step the hazard of death and inevitably suffering it at last. I must confess that these unjust attacks have affected me more seriously than all the hardships, fatigues, and, priv and privation which I have encountered in the interior of Africa. Now, uh, Sir Richard Burton also traveled to Mecca disguised uh, as, as a Muslim, and uh, um, Kaye sort of does, does the same thing. Many were uh, very critical of this. He, you know, he was there for so long, and he, he, he prayed as a Muslim for so long that many just felt this, that, that, it was, that he could pray five times a day as a Muslim and adopt every external aspect of the Islamic religion and yet remain on the interior uh, a Christian. Kaye probably rightly observes that he wouldn't have made it out alive unless he had adopted the strategy that he did. Um, but this, he suffered because of this criticism. Uh, but, you know, uh, others found him to be very admirable. Now, there's a book by Galbraith Welch. This is just one example. Like I said, there are many, many instances of the Timbuktu narrative. It remains, even today, very prominent uh, genre. Uh, this is a narrative around the story of, of, of getting somehow to Timbuktu. Travelers retell this story over and over again. Now, this particular narrative is a very poisonous narrative, very toxic recounting of the adventures of Rene Caillet. It's one of the more racist texts that I've read. I'm, I'm not going to read some of the more racist passages, but I'll just give you a few instances of, of say, Welsh's um, enthusiasm for Caillet uh, and his admiration at the same time while he's kind of looking down his nose at him at the same time. He, Caillet, fell in love with the name. It was a love to which he remained indomitably faithful. Kaye was the first white man to tear the veil of mystery from Timbuktu. There's that very, this is Saeed observes this kind of oriental saying, te tearing the veil away. He saw more of Africa than any other white man. His book was a revelation to the white world. There was something almost miraculous about Kaye. What he did was extraordinary. What he was, even more so, a white hero. Okay, well, there we go. Uh, to his odd nature, exploring Africa was ecstasy. Curiosity made him invincible. The knowledge that he was seeing alone, wide stretches on which the eyes of a white man had never before rested, thrilled him and gave him unearthly strength. Okay, this is that sense of Pratt's describing of seeing with imperial eyes, the imperial eyes of, of a white man. Uh, this is what uh, Welch is celebrating. And, and I think, you know, in fairness to Kaye, it's not, you know, Kaye is, is more humble than, than many of, of the travelers. Again, I think because he was so poor, came from such a humble background. Um, there, here's uh, also uh, Welch. There is heart-rendering pathos in all his frankly confessed, twisted and squirmings, humiliations and groveling misery. He reveals everything to the reader. He is without shame. He would eat mud and let Negroes spit upon him so long as he got forward along his road, and he would admit it all without reserve. Okay, 
Well, I'm going to, this concludes the first part of our lectures on uh, the Timbuktu narrative. I'm going to give one more lecture on this, and we'll look at some of the other travelers that helped to seal and establish this genre. Uh, here you can see some busts of Kaye uh, and the plaque on his, on the house where he stayed when he was in Timbuktu in 1828. Uh, and he remains, you know, this 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 somewhat legendary figure in uh, in, in France uh, today for his, uh, you know, travels and adventures.